I'm in the Denver, Colorado area. Uh, I've, I've been airbrushing, well, 20 years, maybe a little more, uh, on and off. And uh, while I don't consider myself an expert in airbrushing, I have picked up an awful lot throughout the years. And uh, I, do, I do think I'm pretty decent at it. But uh, this class is mainly going to be about um, usage of, or I should say, how to uh, uh, maintain it how to fix a needle if it, if it bends, what kind of airbrush to pick if you don't have one, uh, air sources, safety, uh, that kind of thing. Maybe, maybe some quick tools, stuff like that that, uh, that I have. So first off, the way an airbrush works is it's basically a fancy spray can. You've got an air, air that comes up into the body and then travels down, down the front of the airbrush and it mixes with paint that, it, that comes down through either the, the gravity feed color cap or a siphon feed uh, bottle. And it will end up mixing in the front and then aerosolizes using a, a needle and a nozzle system out the front end. So it's just basically a controllable spray can on a, on a very fine level. Uh, and depending on, on how you use your air, how you use your, your thickness of your paint, how far away, that's how you determine what your, your size of your, your spray is, how fine it is, and how, how good of a coverage you're going to get. So um, all I have are double action airbrushes. And what a double action means is that you push the button on to turn, to, to turn the air on, and then you pull back. And then that, if you can see it, let's see if I can move this around here. You can see that needle at the front end get retracted. What that does is as the needle is retracted, then paint can flow out that, uh, that front end and atomize it. So for the farther back you pull this, the, the more paint is gonna come out. So that, that's, a, that's what double action means. A single action, you only turn the air on and then you've got a, a, a chuck back here that moves the, the needle in and out uh, to, a, to a preset area. Um, a, lot of, a lot of double action airbrushes though can work as a single action. Like th this is a harder and steam back airbrush. And what that means, uh, you can push this in, and it pushes this little nut that's right here. I don't know if you can see that too well. But as you screw it in and out, you can screw it out a little bit, it will keep the, the trigger from only going to a certain spot. So if you find a, a, a size of line that you like, you can then just push the, uh, the trigger back just to a certain spot, and it'll spray like that all the time. And then if you need to change it, you can pull that out, do your infinite thing, and then go back in and you're right back to where you were. So it's, it's actually really handy to have. The, uh, the Reaper Vex also has that, that uh, uh, preset uh, needle right there as well. Um, a lot of your higher end airbrushes do. I recommend it. Um, if, if you can spend the extra money, I do recommend it to get, get something like that just because it, it is pretty handy if you're doing large areas or if you're painting an army or, or illustrations or something like that, and you need to be able to set it into one spot, it's much easier to, to handle that. Um, somebody says, I want a Reaper Vex and just got a Master Airbrush 1 5th HP Cool Runner 2 dual fan air compressor. Is this a good air compressor for this airbrush or any airbrush? We'll, we'll go into air compressors. I'm not familiar with that exact one, but we'll go into air, air sources here in a little bit. Um, it's, it's probably, it's probably a, a good one. Um, a lot of, a lot of the dedicated airbrush compressors there, all they need to do is be able to push air with a, with a certain style and, and they'll work great. So we'll get more into air, air sources here in a little bit. And somebody also said, how do you keep the lines from fading out after you set the dial? I don't quite understand. What do you mean fading out? <laughs> Maybe when you're using, which we'll, we'll 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 spray a little bit of water and I'll show I'll show what I'm talking about here. Oh, okay. okay. In just in just a few minutes, hopefully hopefully that'll that'll become clear. If it's not, uh, tell me what you mean by fading out. Um, okay. So anyway, there there's a couple of different styles of airbrushes. As, as I said, there's there's a gravity feed, which is where the the paint comes into a cup at the top, and then flows in to the airbrush body that way. The other style is a siphon feed. And what that, what that means is that there's a bottle on the side of the airbrush 
like this. This is an Iwata Eclipse that you connect a, your paint jar up to, and it sucks the paint up uh, using using the uh, air pressure that you're you're pushing through uh, directly. The advantages of a gravity feed is they use a, a, a thinner paint. Um, they're generally the more more traditional kind, a little bit thinner paint, a uh, little bit uh, lower pressures. Uh, they can get away with, so they can do much finer detail work. The uh, the siphon feeds, since they they require air pressure to uh, siphon the the paint up, they need a little bit higher pressure, but at the same time they're a lot easier to change colors because you can just take that bottle off and then put on another another color bottle and away you go. A lot of t-shirt artists use use these because they, they spray at a higher pressure because they need the, the velocity of that air to be able to push that pigment into the paint or into the into the t-shirt. So they'll they'll spray it a lot higher higher pressure and then they just change out their colors as they need to. Uh, something like this, I generally spray uh, I, I I spray at a very low PSI. I'm I'm somewhere between 10 and 20 PSI. And uh, the reasons for that is when you increase your PSI, whenever you're you're spraying something, that air velocity is coming out. I'm also generally very close to, to what I'm spraying. So that air velocity is coming out and it, it's carrying that paint with it. Well, if it's too fast, it's gonna bounce off of, of whatever it is you're, you're painting and you're gonna end up getting pigment in the, in the air. You're gonna have overspray, things like that. Um, and so I, I just find it easier just to, to do a, a, a much lower PSI and then it's much, much more controllable for me. If uh, your paint is clogging uh, at a lower PSI, then that means it's not thin enough, if it's not coming out. Um, generally, I thin my paints to about 2% milk uh, for, for an average, and then I go down from there, all the way down into, into uh, almost water-like consistency. Like, like this guy has got a, a 0.15 uh, needle, and I'll have to thin it to, to almost ink consistency to be able to to spray out of this, and we'll we'll spray out of it, uh, spray some water, and then we'll spray uh, real paint in the uh, the next class. But you, you end up needing to to thin it quite quite handily. Uh, if if your paint is is clogging not just from from air pressure, but if it's clogging because it, it does actually get chunks in it or something along those lines, you're going to have to filter it. Uh, I don't have any, um, but Micromark sells a funnel that's kind of like this that ends up with just some filter media at the bottom of it. And you just end up pouring your, your uh, straining your paint through that. And it's just a, a very fine mesh filter. This airbrush also has what's called a, a uh, Mac valve. I, I can't remember what, a manifold air control, something like that. And so you can actually control your air velocity uh, through this little valve as well, not just the PSI on the on the air compressor, but also the, the air velocity through here. It's kind of handy when you need to, to change something or if you're looking for like some spatter effects, uh, just some more interesting stuff like that. Um, so I'm going to show you how to, how to field strip an airbrush if you've got chunks that just won't seem to come out. This airbrush, uh, you just put, pull the back off, undo the needle check, and then you can pull the, the needle out through the back end and set it down. And I've got this neoprene uh, tray right here that I can set things on and, and it's soft so that it won't bend my needles or anything. This is a very delicate, you get a little, uh, since it's a, it's a 0.15, it's a very, very fine needle. It will kind of bend when you look at it funny. Pull the front off, the, crown, the, the front air, air and the uh, crown cap off. And then there's a nozzle that comes out, and that's also a very fine thing too. The the higher end airbrushes, uh, that's this is where your your money is 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 the needle and the nozzle pairing. That that taper that it matches better on uh, they they spend all of their money on machining to uh, to be able to match it match it better. So that's that's what the difference is between a uh, you know, a $50 master airbrush and a, you know, uh, $150 Iwata is that, that they're just going to have a, a uh, better mass machining, better tolerances on here. All right. So I, like I said, I typically don't take uh, my airbrushes apart uh, unless there is something wrong and I do have to actually field strip and clean them. Uh, the reason for that is that every time you pull these apart, 
and you get some some interaction between all of this stuff, you're going to have a little bit of wear there. And uh, the, 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 the more you do that, the, the quicker things are going to wear out. So I only do a field strip like this when I absolutely have to, if, it, if it's spraying wrong or you've got a different pattern, something along those lines. All right, so then to clean the needle, I always put on a set of gloves. In fact, I usually work in, in uh, nitrile gloves just, just constantly. I end up just buying them, buying a whole bunch of them from Costco at once. I like the, the Costco ones. They're, they're powderless. They fit really well. They uh, have got a little bit of texture on the fingers. Um, I just, I, I, they're not very expensive. They're just a good glove. All right, and then I take a paper towel and I always use Viva brand paper towels. Uh, and the, the reasoning behind that is I found Viva to not shed fibers as much as other, other paper towels. Looks like my I gave my dog a trim earlier today and so I've got dog hair everywhere. Looks like I got some dog hair on this, but anyway, they don't seem to shed fibers uh, as much, so. I take a cleaner and I take a cleaner that's compatible with whatever I'm, I'm spraying. So if I'm spraying acrylics, I use something like Easy Air, uh, Iwata's got a cleaner, Badger's got a cleaner, et cetera. And what the, the difference between a cleaner and a thinner is the cleaner is made to actually destroy that binder that the paint uses. The thinner is gonna just thin the, the, the binder out. This will actually eat it and uh, get, it, get it off of your, your materials. So a, a thinner can work as a cleaner, but I generally don't recommend it. I just squirt some on a paper towel, and then I turn the, the needle like this as I'm pulling it backwards. And I always pull it backwards rather than push it forward because you may end up bending the needle if you jam it into something. So I always, always just pull backwards. We do have a question. Is there a health risk in not wearing gloves? Uh, I'm sure there is. Um, I always wear gloves. Um, I've actually had several health scares, and so I'm kind of paranoid that way. So I would always wear gloves. Um, and I also wear, you know, a lot of, uh, I wear a respirator when I'm spraying. Uh, I've got a spray booth here. Uh, you've only got one set of lungs. So, yeah, I, I, I just don't like it. You know, even if you, you go and wash, you've got uh, paint all over your hands, something along those lines, you, uh, and you still go wash them, you're still going to have little bits of paint up in the, the, the crevices of your fingernails, things like that, you know, and I, I, I just don't like that. I, I prefer to, to wear gloves and just get it out of there. All right, so then I do the same thing on the, on the nozzle. Got my little bit of cleaner on my my nozzle and I, I just swipe it gently back and forth as I'm pulling it rather than pushing it. There are little picks and little brushes that you can get to get up inside. These are interdental brushes that have a kind of a plastic uh, ridge in here so they're not gonna, gonna scratch anything. And you can, you can do the same thing and just get some cleaner on there and then just kind of push it up very gently and go back and forth, try to scrub out the nozzle. And then you can use that same, that same pick to go into the body of the airbrush, down the, the paint channel, etc. They do make specific airbrush cleaning brushes. They're, uh, I believe Badger makes them. Or at least that's where I got mine was through Badger. And I'm not seeing them offhand. They're a, uh, they look like big pipe cleaners. I thought it was glass pass, what happened to them? Anyway, they're, they're, they're metal with uh, brushes around them. So they're a little bit bigger than these, these interdental brushes. The, uh, with, with being a metal body, some people uh, say that they kind of scratch things up. 
but I, I honestly, I've been using, using that brush for 20 years and I haven't had any problems on any of my, my airbrushes. Um, and if they do get little micro scratches, little imperfections in there, when you're assembling the airbrush back up, you can use some, uh, use a lube. Uh, this is Iwata's uh, Super Lube. Uh, Badger makes one, I think they call it needle juice or red gab. Um, you end up just putting just a little bit on the front end of the needle. And then I do the same thing. I just, and this is, I do push it forward this way, but you notice I've got the, the pointy end exposed. And I just go down just a little bit as I'm spinning it to get it in there. And you only need to go down about this far because one, the interesting stuff in the airbrush happens in the in the first bit of it. And two, when you push it in from the from the back end like this, it's gonna hit these, these uh, packing rings and it's gonna spread that along. So whenever I'm pushing a needle into the back end of the airbrush, I use a finger, whether it be my pinky or my index finger, to just kind of help guide it in and press gently. And it should just slide on without getting a lot of resistance. You'll end up seeing it come out the front end. I just always kind of pull it back a little bit. And then on this one, the nozzle goes into the, the front end. So I end up doing the same thing. I've got a little bit of lube on my, my fingers here. So I just put just a little bit of that in there. And that lube will just help seal it. And it'll also just help move things move around easier. If you can, try to get some a little bit on the threads. It'll just, you know, again, you don't need very much. And I just push that in, turn it. And I only go finger tight. Um, if you use a wrench, a lot of times you can pull this down too much and it'll end up fluting the nozzle out. It'll, it'll uh, spread it out or crack the nozzle and you'll end up having problems that way. So then I just push it in, just go gently. I usually give it about a half a turn or so just to make sure that everything seats up. Screw the needle chuck down and away you go. Now, some people also will use a, uh, an ultrasonic cleaner. I've got one right here, got it on Amazon for about 20 bucks or so. Um, it, it works pretty well uh, for really, really gummed up airbrushes and parts and things like that, but only use water in there. Uh, it works by a mechanical uh, ultrasonic vibration to get the, the debris that's, that's on there off. And so if you've got something caustic, like a simple green or a Windex or something like that, and you've got a little imperfection somewhere on your, your airbrush, it's going to act like a drill and just go right through it. Uh, for example, I've got a color cup from my Iwata Eclipse, and you can see it's lost all the chrome on the inside. And that was from using, using Windex. Even though it was acetone free, it still just etched that, that uh, chrome right off to, down to the brass. It hasn't affected the functionality of it. It's just kind of ugly. Uh, and then now there's there's micro scratches on there. And so now that's a that's a spot where paint can accumulate. You can see where I've got paint that I just I can't seem to get off of there. It doesn't affect again, it doesn't affect the operation. It just is on there. Any questions so far? Nope, not uh Somebody just commented, if you dislike gloves because of the moisture buildup inside the gloves, you can get linen glove liners that really help with that. Yeah, yeah. I, um, Colorado, since we're like negative 20% humidity, I really don't have a problem with uh, sweating in, in these things. I can wear them for a couple hours before I really notice a, notice a problem um, in, in hot humid areas, you know, Florida or something along those lines, that's probably a, a more of a concern. You, and you can get little light, light cotton gloves that, uh, that go inside of those. But uh, to me, a little bit of sweat is worth whatever the, the health problems are. All right, so let's say for, uh, for sake of argument, you've been to needle somehow. You've got a problem with it and you need to fix that needle. I'm gonna take one of my other airbrushes apart. This needle 
you're a klutz like me and you've actually stabbed something and bent that needle a little bit. A couple of ways to fix it. One is don't do that. Two is buying a new needle. Um, and I, I get all of my, my airbrush supplies for my Awadas. I get them all from a, a guy named Tom Grossman at Tag Team Hobbies. Um, and then my, my harder and steam back I get from, from Jesse Garcia at Garage Kits US Colors. Uh, that, all these are in my, my Discord as well. Uh, they're great people to help you with anything you want. And then my, my VEX, uh, I haven't needed to get parts for it yet, but Reaper is now carrying VEX parts. And my Badger I get from uh, USA Airbrush Supply, which is Badger. So it, it, whenever I need a part, like a needle or a nozzle, I end up buying two of them so that I've always got one in stock. Because uh, I always, I, being a klutz that I am, I always seem to bend these things at about two in the morning, and then I can't get can't get another one. So I always have I always have at least one in stock. All right, so let's. You're in trouble. Got a problem. You still gotta gotta repair that needle. So you do two things. You take a piece of cardboard, like from an Amazon shipping box and a bathroom tile. You can get a bathroom tile at Home Depot real cheap. You don't need one this big. It just happens to be the size that I had left over from a bathroom remodel. You've got a little hook in your, in your uh, needle. You can kind of hold it on the taper like that and just kind of, kind of twist it back and forth to try, to try to get that hook out as best as you can. And it's not going to be perfect right here, but it, it'll help it at least. Then after you, after you finish doing that, take your cardboard and bend it between the, the corrugations and you're gonna get a nice straight line like that. And there's enough, um, there's enough abrasiveness in this cardboard that as you, as you pull it along, it's gonna polish that needle. You spin it and it's gonna end up polishing that needle just enough. And you do that uh, a couple of dozen times or so and it'll, it'll get you, Get you through what what you got a problem until you can until you can get another needle. And then oh, I guess the the other thing to do that'll work even better is there's a product called a Sharpen Air, uh, and I got this from from Tom Grossman at Tag Team Hobbies as well. They make two different kinds. There's there's a uh, the Iwata and other brands like Bayer and Chandler, Pache, et cetera, have a have one taper. And then Badger has a has another taper onto there. So there's there's a Badger style and then there's an Iwata style. And so what you do is you take this, and again I use I use a finger to help guide it in. And you push it in, and then you spin it, go to the next one. There's there's four different uh, grades of uh, sharpening stones in here. Go to the next one, spin. Go to the next one, spin, etc., and that'll also uh, grind the uh, the hook out of there. And then it comes with a, a little piece of four thousand grit sandpaper that you end up using to just kind of polish it up. Works really well. The, the, this product I think is around fifty bucks ish. Um, I paid a little bit more than that for it, but it's gone cheaper. Um, and when a needle like a like these harder and steam deck needles are are really expensive. You know, repairing one or two of these needles pays for pays for the uh, the sharpener itself. The the I the, this Iwata needle and the uh, the Vex needles aren't nearly as expensive. I think they're only about ten or fifteen dollars. But like a an Iwata Micron is a lot more expensive. My harder and steam back is a lot more expensive, etc. All right, so let's talk about air sources now. We've got uh, got to get a, a method for getting air up in there. Uh, you can get little cans of air from Badger. They're called Propel. I, I started out using those. I don't recommend them. The problem with them is as you use them, their air pressure changes. And of course, there's you know an environmental cost with them and, and such. Um, so the, the second thing I did is, is get a really big version of that, which was a air tank. Uh, they use them for, for Pumping up tires, things like that. I got about it was about a 15 gallon air tank here. I'm gonna change my so you can see me, so I can I can uh, do the hand wavy part here. So I got an air tank from from Walmart. I think it was around 30 30 dollars or so. It was a 15 gallon tank. I'd take it to a gas station and pump it up, and then to about 120 psi, and then I'd use that, and it worked great. Uh, the only problem was is that uh, it it had run out of air at about two in the morning, and then I'd I'd 
be in trouble. Well, so then I ended up getting two of those and then I just rotate them around. Um, I worked really, really well. Uh, then the, the next thing I did is I, I ended up getting a shop compressor. I had a, a larger house after I moved and, and I needed some air tools anyway. And that worked really well too. Um, the only problem was is that it was an auto on off. So it had run to fill up the tank and then I'd be out there spraying and the tank would, tank would be running, it would run out and it'd turn on and it'd come on with a big shock and it'd, it'd scare me. And so I'd end up ruining whatever it was that I, that I was painting. Uh, so the, the way I ended up fixing that was I ended up having a workshop in my basement and I'd just run 200 feet worth of, worth of airline down into that workshop and then I couldn't hear the air compressor. But the rest of the family complained because they could hear it. So eventually my wife bought me a dedicated compressor. So I've got an Iwata SmartJet Pro. Let's see if I can get that in there. Yeah, I've got an Iwata SmartJet Pro and it's a... Uh, a uh, dedicated airbrush compressor. It, the smart part is that it only runs when you're actually using air. And it, it's very quiet. It's only about as noisy as a refrigerator. You can kind of see it shake a little bit when it turns on. And only, it only needs to run exactly when you're, you're pulling on the air. So it, it uh, stays nice and cool, lasts forever. That airbrush, uh, that compressor is, is like almost 15 years old, I think. And I haven't had to do any maintenance on it whatsoever. Uh, so it, I think it was a little more expensive, it was around 300 and some dollars. But again, o over that amount of time, I just haven't had any problems with it. Um, if the, the, you get other compressors out there too, um, a lot of the new shop compressors are really quiet. Uh, that, that master uh, airbrush compressor, uh, if it's got twin fans on it, I'm gonna guess that means it's got a, an air tank. Uh, if it's got a tank on it, that's a, that's a really good thing because when the air compressor is, is running and it's gonna be running those pistons back and forth, you're gonna actually get pulsing in the line. Uh, the, the way uh, Iwata fixes that, that pulse is it's got about 20 feet worth of, or of small hose before it goes, uh, leaves the air compressor. Uh, and so it kind of absorbs that, that, uh, that, that pulse. Um, but the tank will also do that. Uh, the one thing you got to watch with a tank is that when you compress air, it's going to get it's, the water in the, the air is going to drop out and it'll sit down at the bottom of your tank and it'll rust. So you just need to empty the tank every now and then, uh, drain the tank out of, out of water. Um, you'll also need uh, a moisture trap on the, the uh, air compressor. My Awada has one built in. Um, you can also get little compressors like this. This is an Iwata. Uh, Ninja Jet. Um, it will run constantly, so it is a little bit, uh, a little bit noisier, uh, and it it's also a little bit tougher to control in that it doesn't have a TSI adjustment. It's just got this little screw right here, plus or minus, and so you kind of got to work by feel. It'll it, it does the job though. It, I use this at uh, various conventions and, and things like that, um, and you can see that it's got a a long hose this long coiled hose that uh, tries to absorb that pulsing, but you can still see it every now and then. Um, it doesn't come with a moisture trap. And so you get a uh, pistol grip uh, moisture trap that goes on the front, the front of the airline. And then the nice thing about that is then when you're holding your airbrush, it works as a filter as well. So. And then I've also used like CO2 tanks from uh, like a welding shop, uh, nitrogen tanks, et cetera. I've used those at various conventions and they work really well too. Uh, the, the price on them is fairly economical uh, and they're completely dry and they're silent as well. The, the only thing is, is I don't like having this tank that's like 3000 PSI uh, next to me. Um, it, it, I grew up in, in Utah in earthquake country and if that tank falls over for whatever reason, the, the regulator snaps, whatever, it's gonna, it's gonna kill somebody uh, or it has the potential to. So I try, I, I, I stay away from that. Um, I, I prefer a compressor itself, but I know a lot of people use those tanks without any trouble, scuba tanks, et cetera. Uh, as long as you can get it regulated down, you'll be okay. All right, let's see, what other things can we talk about with safety? So safety is the next thing. I've got a spray booth that's full of, full of stuff because I've been using it for these, these classes. This is a, a galvanized sheet metal spray booth that is, has a 350 CFM fan on the back end of it. Um, and it's, 
it's a little noisy, but it works really well. Um, I don't have to, to worry about anything, uh, any uh, gases coming through here, any pigments or anything like that. When you're spraying stuff, you're gonna get stuff out into the air. Well, you don't wanna breathe any of that because that's your, your lungs are designed to only breathe one thing and that's air. So you can, you can suck that, the, the, the noxious stuff away from you and you can also filter it from getting to your face. So as what I do with this is I, I uh, have it suck out. I am working in the basement right now and so I don't have a good way of exhausting this to the to the outside. I I've, I've got to plumb this uh, plumb this exhaust to the to the outside. I just haven't done it yet. Um, so what I've done instead is there is a the the vent comes out of the back end of the booth and then it goes into that uh, bucket right there. And that bucket is full of furnace filters and then it's got about about an inch and a half of water or so at the bottom of it as well. And so what, what happens is that vent is then down just a, a little bit above that water. And so when you turn it on, the particulate uh, goes and hits that water and is trapped there. And then the, the fumes themselves, the, the smaller stuff, you can see there's uh, the, the dark things at the top of the, that bucket there. Those are the exhaust holes and I've got charcoal filters on top of that. Those do feel, need to be replaced every now and then, but for light airbrushing, uh, light and medium airbrushing, that works really well. Uh, there's plans on my Discord on the uh, Reaper server on how to build your own, uh, both a spray booth and the uh, the bong itself. We, could, we end up calling those booth bong, but you can also um, build yourself a, a spray booth out of a clear Rubbermaid uh, container with some lights and a and a bathroom fan. And as long as you're not spraying anything really noxious, you'll be fine. If you're if you're going to be spraying enamels, lacquers, things like that, you're going to want to either spray that outside. Uh, or you're you're going to need to be able to exhaust this outside and, and uh, uh, work with it that way. So, talked about booths. Oh, in Amazon, there's there's a uh, there's a specific hobby uh, spray booth that you can get on Amazon. I, I think I put the link uh, to one example on my Discord as well. They're about yay big, about yay tall. And they, they actually work really well. They have a, a nice long hose that you can run to your to a window and it, it's narrow, it's about like that. So you can open up the window, shove that, that little end out and then close the window on it. That actually works out pretty well too. Uh, it'll just, just suck it out. Um, I think, I wanna say there, when we bought the one that we've got in our hobby shop is around 70 bucks, but it, they've gone up since then. I, I think the one that I, I saw in that link was around 120. Um, the other thing you want to do is be able to filter your filter your your lungs. So I've got a no kidding real paint respirator here. It's not a not just a cloth mask. It's it's uh, it's a P100 filter. Uh, these are removable filters, so you can you can change them out. What the P100 means? The P means that it is oil oil resistant and, and will uh, filter 99.95 percent of uh, particulate down to five microns. Uh, we all are familiar with N95 masks. What, what the N means is that it's not oil proof and it only filters 95%, where this will get 99.95. Uh, these were really hard to come by last year, uh, but now they're, they're back to being able to be found. I, I saw them at uh, uh, Home Depot on their website yesterday. They're around $30, $40. And then the, uh, the, the uh, cartridges, uh, replacement ones are like 20 bucks or so. Uh, you do have to end up replacing these cartridges about every six months um, because they work by having air go over them and hit a filter media and charcoal, and that does wear out uh, eventually. Uh, so you, you do need to replace them. I, uh, uh, you also keep them in a, plat in a uh, Ziploc bag so that air can't get to them because the more air uh, gets to these, the quicker that they're gonna wear out the filters. Um, to properly fit one of these, you, I'm not gonna be able to do this because you won't be able to hear me talk. You end up putting it on and then hold, hold your hands over the, uh, the intake like that uh, to, to block it. And then when you breathe in, you'll feel the suction of the mask itself come down. And if you feel air leaks, then you know that you're not, not fit quite right. Uh, so just kind of work on, on making sure that it fits right. Uh, they do make different sizes for faces. Uh, so if you've got, if you're a, a, a smaller individual, you can, you can get a smaller mask. Um, my daughter, when she was around 12, 13 years old, something like that, but we found a, a much smaller mask as well. So they, they do make them to fit just about everybody. 
and and they're important. Again, you only got one set of lungs. You know, thirty forty dollars is pretty worth pretty much worth uh, uh, those lungs. Any questions so far on safety? Guess not. I got to take a drink of water here. Hang on just one second. All right, so some other miscellaneous tools that I have found um, is if my airbrush, if I suspect that I've got a bent needle and I can't tell and I don't have uh, have my optivizers or something along those lines, I, that you can get these these magnifiers. This is a 30 power magnifier and a 60 power magnifier. You can just use that. It's got a little light on it to be able to see what you're doing and use that to, to inspect your needle. And that, that generally works quite well as well, just to, to be able to see if you've got a hook on it, especially if you're, you're working on trying to repair it using that cardboard. If you end up using this to, to study it every now and then, uh, uh, that'll help you quite a bit. Um, I think this was around $10 or so. Um, I actually got it from Tom as well, uh, but I've seen them on, on Amazon as well. But Tom carries them. And again, they're not very expensive. Let's see, other tools that I've seen people use Oh, here's here's an example of that metal brush that I was talking about. Um, that this is this was a uh, in the harder and the steam back cleaning kit that came with my my Infinity airbrush, and it it works great. Like I say, that some people don't like the the fact that there's metal on here, but I I've been using these for years and I've never had a problem. Man, with, also when I am. I'm cleaning things. You can get a power wash bottle. This is uh, from Zeron, and it's just got a needle in there. And I just use whatever cleaning solvents I've got. You can squeeze it, and it'll it'll shoot it out as well. So. All right. So how to use an airbrush itself? What I've got, and we'll go more into this in the class. That's in you know what 45 minutes or so, an hour. Um, I take a little bit of water, and with a with an airbrush like this, you know, just a few drops are going to go quite a ways. So turn your air on, and always keep your air on. Keep the keep the the, the button always down. And when you're pressing on the button, you notice there's a dish in there on on most of these buttons. You've got a little fat or of the the finger. Uh, of your your index finger that you're using to press it down, use that use that little pad to push on there. Don't push with the front of your finger. Always push with the the kind of the back end a little bit. If you press with the front, you're going to wear your hand out, and as you get fatigued, you're going to start shaking. You're gonna you're gonna start having problems. So you you don't need to press very hard either. Just just a real light pressure right there, and just hold on and kind of just keep the keep the air on, and then as you pull back gently. You'll start seeing. This is uh, Japanese calligraphy paper. Oh, it's in, in a single note. And as you pull back, oh, got my airbrush is way up. Notice how that spidered out like that. That was air pressure being way too strong. Uh, I was using my Iwata yesterday, and it, it it uses even stronger air pressure than than this. So uh, when you're there's kind of a triangle and you've got air pressure, you've got viscosity of your paint and then how close your brush is to, to your substrate, whatever it is you're painting. And it, so if you adjust one thing, you've got to adjust the other two to kind of bring that, that in balance in that triangle if you want an equilateral triangle. All right, so then you just pull back a little bit and you'll start getting a little dot like that. And I use, I use this paper because water shows up really well on it. You just end up spraying, spraying little dots. Now, when you when you spray, keep your air on and don't um, don't push the trigger back uh, with any force. Just kind of rock back and forth very gently. There's three basic strokes. You've got a dot like that, and 
yeah, there's some spidering, but other, otherwise, this thing is so fine that it, the dots wouldn't show up if I was going like that. So I'm holding on for a while. You got a line. And what a lot is what the line is is as you're as you're moving, you end up pulling back on your trigger and then pushing pushing in quickly back. You'll end up having a, a solid solid here and a solid here at the end. If you end up getting barbells like that, that means that you're holding in the in the position too long and it's splattering right there. Last stroke is called the dagger stroke. And that one is as you're moving, you turn your paint on and you turn your paint off as you're going. And so the, there's a tail right there that ends up looking like a dagger. This is a really common one when you're doing hair. You end up practicing those three main strokes, and that's that's the foundation of everything that you do is is those three main strokes, because then that's going to going to turn into your crescents. That's going to turn into your loops, in your whirls. How to do your freehand? You do crescents that way, and do crescents that way, and all these are is just modified dagger strokes your noodles, et cetera. So that, those, are the, those are the three, three basic strokes to, to stick with that. Uh, there are other things that you can use to get some neat effects, um, like stencils and brisket and things like that. Like for example, there's texture-based stencils. Uh, the, uh, Iwata makes these, or uh, Medii, which is their art supply uh, uh, arm. And you end up just kind of putting that down spray over area you're wanting, and you end up having kind of an interesting texture that pops out of that. Uh, let's see if I can get a little better shot. If you, if you end up spraying back here, it's gonna fog it in a little better, like that. If you get in nice and tight, and that's not showing up quite as well. The, the paper is drying, <laughs> drying faster than I expected. But if you get in nice and tight with it, you can get some nice hard edges. If you hold the stencil up a little bit, it's gonna, there's gonna be a little bit of overspray, so it'll feather those edges. Let's see if I can, yeah, it's not quite right. Let's see if I can, it's gonna kind of feather those edges around uh, and that ended up feathering too much. Um, but these are all solvent proof. Uh, paint proof, et cetera. And they make them in all kinds of different things. There's there's flames, there's skulls, there's tiki's, et cetera. And if you need to make your own, there's a product called Frisket. What that is, is kind of a low low tack vinyl uh, and you uh, it separates from this this backing paper. Let's airbrush down over here. It separates from that backing paper as a uh, uh, as an adhesive, and then you just end up laying that down on there. So you end up using a a, a craft knife, uh, that's a special kind of knife called a swivel knife, that you extend the. Let me grab it here. It fell off of my table. That you can extend the blade down so that it only ends up cutting just that first layer. So the this is it right here, and it the the knife blade right there swivels depending on what direction you're you're moving this. And you can turn the the blade in and out, uh, up and down, so that it only goes through the uh, through whatever it is that you're you're using to cut as your mask material. Let me put that back here, and then other masking material. Uh, let me get some other masking material. Do you got any questions while I'm digging all this stuff up? Yes, actually, with mask replacement cartridges, is the P100 a NIOSH thing? Should we look for NIOSH certified or does that matter? Yeah, so that's actually the body. NIOSH is the, the body that does the certification of that. So yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a NIOSH thing. It's, a, it's an industrial certification uh, group, kind of like OSHA. 
so yeah, NIOSH certification. Well, it'll be certified to either be you know N95, P100, uh, P95, et cetera, along those li those lines. But yeah, I always look for for P100. Like I say, um, uh, Home Depot, Lowe's, et cetera, carry them. All right. So then there's there's different kinds of tapes out there too. Tamiya makes a tape, and it's this is just a wide version of it. But they come in different widths. It's a rice paper based tape and it's very low tack, like this. It's not too conformal. Uh, so if you're trying to do some, some interesting things with it, it's not, it's not the best at that. It's, it's not terrible, but if you're doing really tight curves, it's not that great, but it's very low tack. So it's not gonna to pull up your paint layers from, from beneath. And one of the big techniques is to have a base coat and then mask off, off areas that you're wanting to do and, and, and have, a, have a larger area. Uh, 3M also makes a delicate surface tape that's kind of the same idea. Uh, it's a little bit wider, so you can use a knife to, to cut things out. Always look for the, the orange version of this. It's a little bit harder to find, but this is the delicate, this is the true delicate surface tape. It's, it's, it's a lot closer to this Tamiya tape. It's smooth, that's one way to tell. If it's, if it's got kind of a rough edge like this and it's not, um, uh, not orange, then you know it's not the uh, not the right stuff. And then auto body shops also make a tape that's made for pinstriping. And this is easier if I take my gloves off. This tape like stick to my gloves. It's a it's a vinyl back tape, so it's stretchy and it's very conform. So you peel a little bit off and th this is 16th of an inch uh, they make it down to 30 seconds of an inch but you can put it on something and it'll stretch so as you want to bend your radiuses you know it'll do a nice tight tight curves and bends and you, you with practice you can actually get tighter than that this is i was just doing this as a, as a quickie thing but you can you can do almost 180 degree bend with very tight radiuses and so what i'll do is if i'm doing something interesting is i'll i'll do my curve with this and then i'll go go in and either uh, cover it with the 3m or this tamiya tape uh, on the the areas that uh, still need to be masked but i don't want to get with that that stuff so if it's you know use use like that to to cover up with the other tape like that that make can you see that okay yeah so you've got the edge right there the, the leading edge of that that vinyl is is uh is the interesting part Although for organics, like figures and things like that. Um, so I, I use this type of stuff if I'm doing vehicles, starships, mecha, et cetera, where I've got a nice hard edge. But on, a, on an organic, like a, like a bust or a, a figure along those lines, where it's a little bit um, more free flowing of a, of a line, like this, this uh, uh, Baron Harkonnen figure right, that I've got right here, I use a product called Parafilm M. And what that is, is it's a, a wax-based uh, laboratory grade, uh, uh, what do I say, beaker. They use it for sealing beakers and, and things like that in, in laboratories. And so it's not reactive to any solvent that I've been able to find. And it comes in these giant rolls, but you can get smaller rolls too. But this was, this is what they had. I think Tom actually has this stuff as well. I think I ended up buying that on Amazon, but I know Tom, Tom sells it as well. So this stuff is kind of shiny until you stretch it out a little bit. You don't need to stretch it very much. It stretches just a little bit, kind of take the shine out of it. What that'll do is it kind of activates it. And it only, stay, it only really sticks tightly to itself, but it'll kind of adhere to just about anything. But there's there's no adhesive in it whatsoever. What you can do is you end up taking this stuff, and I end up just laying it like if I'm trying to to mask off an eye, I just kind of lay it in there, and then I take a burnishing tool of some sort, which in this case happens to be a micro brush, and I just kind of push it. Let's see if I can turn the light off so you can see a little better. Yeah. Then I end up just kind of pushing it 
into place until it sticks. And since there's not a lot of adhesive, a lot of times I'll end up using using tape to to adhere the 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 backing end, back end places. Like if I for this thing, if I was just uh, masking the eye, I'd then use Tamiya tape along here or along here, and then just use this to kind of kind of just mold it around where exactly where I'm looking for. Does that make sense? Any questions? Not so far. Okay. How are we doing on time? We got about 10 minutes. All right. So, you know, one of the things I talked about is the that triangle of PSI and distance and things like that. So I want, I want to explain that a little bit more. Let me get my paper out here. We'll go more into more into this with the, the usage class, but, but I want to get a little bit in here. So like I said, I've got a really low PSI right now. And what that means is that since I don't have a lot of air velocity here to here, that means I can get in real close without having that air bounce back up. And I can get in nice and tight and get real small lines. Even that is, with this particular airbrush, even that's too much. I'm at about 10 PSI now. There we go. I got a little clog in. All right, so now we're nice and small. We got a bend or something. Anyway, we got a nice, nice tight line. I, I'm doing a little, little higher line just because of the PSI here. So I'll try to, yep. There we go. Now it'll show up too. So as you as you pull back, you're going to need to pull back more on the trigger to get a tighter or to to be able to spray on there. If you're if you're this far back, you're not going to get much particulate at all spraying out there, and you're not going to be able to get your nice tight line that you would if you were able to get in a lot a lot closer. So as you get as you get closer, you can reduce your pressure. As you get as you get farther back, if you want to to get a larger spray, you can increase your pressure, get a nice, nice larger spray like that. So I know this thing is open. There we go. My my little Mac valve was was closing it off, so it was about halfway halfway shut down. All right, so. If you're too close and your pressure is too high, that's when you get the spidering effect that goes around. And that's just literally the, the too much pigment hitting and then end up running before it can hit, before it can dry. So if you get that spidering, you know that either your pressure is too high, you're pulling back too far on the trigger, or you're too close to your, your subject. And all that depends on how, how fine of a line you wanna do. If you're, if you're trying to get that real fine line, you need to be nice and close. A lot of crown caps, like this have got cutouts on them. Uh, and the idea there is that when you get up nice and nice and close to something, that allows the air somewhere to go rather than, than bouncing right back towards your airbrush. Some, some airbrushes, like the Vex, has got a, got a closed in air cap. And so what some people do with that is they'll end up just pulling the air cap off and using it that way. And that's the front end of the airbrush itself. No, I can't get it off. Well, I'll show you another airbrush. They all end up doing is pulling the the air cap off, the the crown cap, I should say, all the way off, and then exposing that. the The good news is, is then you can get in nice and tight. The bad news is, is now you got to be really, really careful that you don't bend that that nozzle, that needle. If you touch your your subject, you drop it whatever it's gonna end up bending. Uh, like for example, my SOTAR in Friday's class uh, that fell off, it fell off of my, my uh, holder right here and landed, landed down. Well, now that uh, needle is actually bent and I can't get this off. And of course with 
the uh, the way the, the badger makes these things with these little barbells. I can't pull it back because it's hooked on there and I can't push it forward because of that barbell. So I've got to figure out a way to, to bend that, uh, maybe use a little exacto knife or something like that to get that out of there. Uh, that's, that's probably my actually my one complaint about the VEX is that, that little barbell. I can't I can't do a lot of the maintenance the, the way that I have, have done it for years uh, with that little barbell there. I think if you you uh, start out using that and understand those limitations, you'll be fine. But it just it it doesn't it doesn't work the way that I'm used to having things work. So all right, we've got about five minutes left. Uh, is there anything else we want to talk about? I can show what happens when you've got the PSI turned way up. And I've got enough water in here. So I got my PSI way high and I get in nice and close and it's going to end up spidering all over the place like that. Even, even if I, I'll have to move it a lot faster and of course, faster doesn't have quite the same control with it. If I'm trying to do something straight, I gotta move a lot faster or I gotta be back further. And if I'm back farther, that spray is out there and I'm not gonna be able to get those nice tight lines that I want. So I always, I always like to spray a very low pressure. The other thing is, is that with lower pressure, again, you're not going to have a lot of overspray. You don't end up uh, uh, fogging up your room that you're in, even if you've got a spray booth. That doesn't have to work as hard. Doesn't doesn't use up your filters or anything like that as much. All right. Well, a couple of minutes left. Any any other questions that I can answer? I don't think anything else I haven't covered. Is there there's something that I didn't cover that somebody wants to, to get to? Somebody, any benefit to a full face mask? I wear glasses, so wondering if the masks will cause fogging. So no, the, the mask actually does not cause fogging. What fogging happens because uh, you've got air, like with a with a um, the masks that we're all wearing with COVID, everything's fogging because the air is coming up through from your from your nose area. That moist air is coming up and hitting your glasses. These are designed to seal right here and then have your air exhaust come out the bottom right here through a through a little flap. So they, they actually won't fog at all. If you're if you're fogging your glasses, this isn't sealed right. I said, thank you. You bet. And so that's another thing is the, the COVID masks that we're all using, they're not really an appropriate mask to wear, wear for this kind of thing. They'll, they'll block a lot of the particulate that's coming up, but they're, they're designed to block larger droplets of, of uh, saliva and, and things like that. The aerosolized uh, particulate paint is gonna be much smaller than that. Uh, and so it'll it'll get right through there. Fumes, et cetera, will get right right on through. It looks like uh, Arcos won the poll this time around. Oh man, come on, fabulous! <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> and they said thanks. This is good information. Well, good. I I hope so. I'm I'm probably a little bit lower energy. Um, I've I've taught this twice already this weekend and my brain is kind of in a fog from everything that I've been absorbing at Reaper uh, ReaperCon and, and then teaching it also. So I, I'm probably a little bit lower energy than I normally am. You also had melting pot. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I'm still I'm, I'm still recovering from dinner last night. Uh, um, they also said this has been incredibly informative. Thank you. Well you're you're very welcome. Uh, oh one other thing I'd, I'd like to talk about is with uh, gravity feed airbrushes, they have different size wells for the paint. Um, this one, you can actually change it around. This is a, this harder in the deck, you can actually change the size of the paint cup. Um, I happen to like a smaller paint cup for a couple of reasons. One is when I'm siding down the airbrush when I'm first learning, I don't have that giant paint cup in my way. And so, and the other thing is, is that when it's full of paint, 
you know, up to here or so, then it's going to be tippy. There, there, that's a lot of weight up there. And so it's going to try to make you unbalanced. Um, my Iwata, my side bottle Iwata, uh, this was my first airbrush. I ended up liking, I didn't know if I wanted a siphon feed or a gravity feed at the time. So this this will do both. Well, that this way I can actually sight down it and the, the uh, uh, bottle isn't, or the, the uh, paint cup or the bottle aren't in my way, so it's out completely. But even the Vex has got a, the, you can get the smaller paint cup, and then you don't, you don't have as much of that in the way either. Um, I also always recommend spraying with the lid on, um, because if you end up getting a clog or something like that in there, it's going to end up bubbling back through here. You can actually have paint um, bubble and, and spit out of, out of this, and it'll end up Hit landing on whatever it is you're painting and having problems. And somebody said, I'm a noob one year airbrush person, found your class really informative on many levels. Thank you so much. Well, you're very welcome. Um, like, like I say, I, uh, I got another one coming in an hour. Yeah, it is mm -hmm. an hour. And uh, we'll go over um, more airbrush effects and how to, how to thin paint, how to, to uh, apply paint to to something like this we've got a, a wing here from a king of hell uh and try to do some effects of how to use transparent paints how to make your paints transparent how to how to fit them appropriately uh etc so you know feel free to attend to that one and then I, i'll be on my discord as much as i possibly can i don't know how how long the discords are going to be open after the con is over but i will try to answer as many questions as i possibly can there's some good links in there and, and some good information on, on that Artist Alley Discord. I gotta say, we have a closing ceremony until like 10 tonight. So I don't know how long after that, probably not until next week, but I can always ask John too. Okay, cool. But all right. There's, oh yeah, lastly in that Discord, and, I, and Taylor, you can probably post the links to it too. There's, there's a, a, a PDF handout that I've got that has a lot of this information in it as well. Um, and a little bit condensed form. It's it's over on my Discord, along with the plans for that booth. Okay, yeah, I'll have to bring that up on this computer. They didn't put me on the Discord, so let's see. I'll have to get that. Okay, well, you can also look at one. it on my, again, you can look at it on my Artist Alley Discord too, so. Yeah. Um, free. Ooh. All right. Sorry, my court, the, the talking thing started at me. Anyway, yeah, I'll try and find.